Hey everybody, this is Perch, and I'm here with Joe again. How you doing, Joe? Yeah, I'm all right, Perch. How are you? I'm doing great. We have a, I mean, I, I, I love the two guests we have on here today, and we're talking about something a little bit different, a little bit special. Uh, Bernard Chang, Tommy Lee Edwards here. How are you both? Hey, good. Good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I, I, this is a, a little bit unusual, and, and I mean, both of you have pretty incredible careers of the the work you've done and, and all the books, and I mean, we could spend easily an hour talking about just each of you individually and all the things you, you've done, but kind of the purpose of us coming here together today was for uh, for a different project, for a different artist, unfortunately passed away, uh, John Paul Yon. Um, how, how, just kind of to introduce, what what is this project that, that both of you are, are on? Go ahead, Bernard. Tommy, you want to go? <laughs> well, I'll, 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 well, we've all, all three of us and, and a few other friends, we've all worked together on lots of different projects. Um, so in a weird way, this kind of feels like uh, another one of our, our projects, you know, except this one's all about JP and doing it while he's not here. Um, so it's uh, uh, The Winter Men, which is a book that, JP started in, was it, I think 2005, um, and, um, took him a good few years to do it, um, partly for, because of, uh, scheduling things, publishing things, um, uh, writer disappearing, you know, <laughs> lots of weird stuff, but then the, um, uh, and, and also his health, you know, so a lot of stuff that, um, but there's a, uh, there's a real special quality to that book that I think because it was something that he had co-created with Brett Lewis and it was like his baby, I think, um, and very passionate about it. Uh, it's really like the storytelling, the drawing, the, everything he did. I think he made huge leaps and bounds uh, with it. Not that he wasn't already the best, um, but yeah, he just, uh, I, if anything was going to get, the royal treatment of a of an artist edition book. Um, this this is it. Uh, this mm -hmm. is kind of the JP's crown jewel. So that's what we're working on is the, the artist edition. And you've seen those books by uh, IDW before the artist edition books. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So it's, it's that started with with um, Scott Dunbeer at IDW. Uh, we we've known each other for years and years, and we worked together at Wildstorm and stuff. And uh, so that's kind of how this project started was shortly after JP passed, you know, it was kind of like a few of us and Dave Johnson and a bunch of guys were like, man, wouldn't it be great to have a artist edition of winter world, uh, winter, winter world. That's another book winter <laughs> Man someday, you know, and it's like, um, and so Scott, you know, approached us about doing it. And then we talked to Christina, JP's wife and, and so, yeah, that, that's basically the project. And, and rather than Scott doing it through IDW, we decided let's do it ourselves, crowdfund it, and then that way we don't have to worry about uh, solicitations and scheduling and print and the, the publisher getting money from it and everything like that. All Any any and all profits will go right to JP's family. So it's going to make it a lot uh, – we'll have a lot more control over that kind of stuff. That's wonderful. Um, I love the the purity of that. And I mean, it fits with this title. This was a 2005 uh, Wildstorm book. And it didn't, I, as I recall, it was one of those books, uh, you see these from time to time, where as it was released, it was getting some attention, but it seemed like its second life kind of kicked in later. It, it's like more people took note of this as time went by. And it became more of this, as you've said, signature piece uh, for him. And uh, to do it in this kind of style, this kind of format, and to do it to benefit his family is 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 really incredible. Um, Bernard, how how did you get attached to this? Well, I mean, Tommy and I, um, we both consider John Paul Leon our our best friend, and um, I've known John Paul since uh, high school. Uh, we met uh, when we were ninth grade auditioning for a new art high school down in Miami, Florida. Um, during the break, you know, we had to bring our portfolio and do some still life drawings on site. Uh, during the break, I, I pulled out my sketchbook and I started drawing, um, uh, doing a sketch of Thor. And uh, lo and behold, the kid sitting next to me looked over my shoulder, sees the drawing and, you know, says, oh, you're a fan of uh, 
you know, you're a fan of the God of Thunder? I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm more of a fan of Walter Simonson. He's called like, oh, Walter Simonson. And, nice. uh, you know, you saw his eyes lit up, and that, and that kid was John Pollyon. And um, uh, so we kind of grew up together. We went to high school together. Um, during college, we both went to art colleges in New York. He went to SVA. I went to Pratt. Um, we both had our uh, sample portfolios, shopping our artwork, trying to break into the business. And, um, you know, so there's a long history. Um, Tommy also uh, met John Paul later on uh, when we were kind of establishing our professional careers. And, um, you know, the three of us, uh, well, we would all talk and chat and work together. Um, I'm mm -hmm. sitting at my, my drawing table right now. And uh, every, every week uh, we'd call each other uh, and talk um, and just chat about art, chat about comics, um, chat about life. Um, and so there's a very deep personal connection um, between us and, um, and JP. And so, you know, John passed away this year. Uh, in May, um, Tommy and I were with the family and with him uh, in his final moments. Mm. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a project that we felt um, is very dear uh, to us, but also it's, um, you know, very few people get to see original artwork um, and also the format. Um, that comics are made in. An artist edition is 11 by 17. Um, you basically see the boards as they were originally drawn, scanned in raw. You can see the eraser marks, the whiteout. Um, John used a lot of whiteout, <laughs> a lot of white paint and redrawing. Um, and it's a, we thought it was a great way to really um, show appreciation by showing, um, by having an opportunity for people to uh, kind of see John's work in, in its purest form. It's it's an incredible format, um, like you say, and, and I think when I think about an artist of uh, John's skill um, and talent and being able to see all those moments, I mean, I, I think this is a rare thing. A lot of people don't get to see this, this side of the artwork. Like you said, they don't get to see the original art. And to have it presented in this way, kind of full, I think, 12 by 17 is how this is being printed. Um, you're, the, the quality of, of what they do, it's hard to kind of maybe explain just verbally, but it's you see the different depths of, of black. Uh, you can see where it's, it's you know, the, 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 the depth of the shading uh, right, right there on the page. Yeah, usually um, when, when <clears throat> we scan stuff in then to color, either, either we're coloring it ourselves or sending it off to someone or whatever, you, you lots of times will um, uh, last several years, at least for me, I've, I've just been scanning all my work in grayscale, but what we used to do is everything was all just, you know, a, a, a stat or a, you know, a, a, a straight black and white, everything was black or white, you know, and then after you scan it, maybe you might change, play with the, if you were using Photoshop or something, you play with, with the, the levels. levels. Yeah. Exactly. So it's kind of like, um, you know, you're getting it ready. Uh, and, and also lots of times, you know, you make it a bitmap file and stuff. And right. but so, so lots of times, yeah, I mean, it's really like, uh, um, what you're seeing in the printed book is you very rarely get to see like, you know, I mean, as artists, you know, we're always like, Oh my God, look at this original of, you know, blank, you know, and, and, you know, and it, you get to see all the, all, yeah, all the stuff, all like, like Bernard said, all the white and everything. My wife colored um, some of Winterman. And she colored the Static Shock and a, and a bunch of other stuff with JP. And and yeah, his pages were so heavy because of all the white paint and then ink and then white and then ink. But yeah, it was kind of like um, uh, you know he was he, he was a perfectionist. Um, yeah. You know sometimes uh, sometimes aggravatingly. Uh, so, you know, cause he just, man, 
he couldn't let go because, <laughs> you know, I mean, but that's a big part of like why it's like, you know, he's, he's, he's already, he's got this legacy, you know? Um, yeah. I, I was actually staying with John um, at his home in Miami when he was working on the initial issues of the winter men. And um, there was a opening splash page that he redrew five to six times <laughs> wow. and, uh, while I was there for a week. And I'm like, John, let's just, you know, just finish it. I mean, the first version was great already. Of course, each inter each version, there was an incremental increase in quality and storytelling. Um, but I'm like, look, dude, just, <laughs> just turn it in. Um, the reader is not going to be able to understand or see or a, a, appreciate the percentage, you know, you know increase in, in storytelling. Um, and we just got to get, let's just get this thing done. But John was a perfectionist, uh, like, like Tommy said, and he was really the artist's artist. Um, and that's who he was doing it for, you know, I mean, yeah. he was doing it for, you know, for me and Bernard and the other artists who would actually, you know, notice it. Right. I mean, that's what I was doing it for too. You know, it was like every single day, you know, sending stuff back and forth, you know, back in the day, God, remember when we share stuff with fax machines and stuff, you know, <laughs> and you know, there's actually, I remember the first time, uh, this is probably, I don't know, 93 or something. And JP hadn't, didn't know Jorge Zafino at the time. And I had the uh, Punisher Kingdom Gone book, and I Xeroxed the page of it, so it looked like crap already. And then I faxed it to him, you know, because I was so into the stuff. And um, and then like, and then I eventually, this is when he was still in New York. And then I went to his place in New York, and there's this fax stuck to the wall. I could barely see it, you know, but. You know, we're just so always getting each other excited about stuff, you know? And so that's kind of like, you know, I think that's been the hardest thing for me too, is like while I'm working, having that constant wanting to share it uh, with each other. So, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like, you know, you're, even though, you know, he's in Miami, Bernard's in LA, I'm in North Carolina, and but we always felt like we're all in the same room together, you know? So, so it's been a weird adjustment for all of us yeah. and jp john was a very private person um the last issue of the winter men the uh, winter men special issue six um he that was drawn while he w was initially diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. and so he was going through chemo treatments um while he was working on that la final issue and he kept his uh, medical condition a secret. He didn't yes. want to tell anybody. He didn't want any pity from any fans or any other artists and peers uh, about his you know, condition. Um, he purely wanted his work to stand on its own. And the integrity um, that he upheld um, for himself and for his work um, is something that's truly admirable but when you, and when you look at the pages, you can see the dedication um, in each pencil stroke and each pen um, and each brush uh, stroke. It's uh, so that's why, like, having an artist edition, um, you really get to see um, what the what the creator kind of like, uh, you know, what what each individual artist in their own frame. The amount of work that they put into each page and each panel. JP was also an artist that collected a lot of reference. Um, and when we talk about reference, it's um, there's a, a lot of artists that use reference, but then they're um, uh, manipulating it or, or using it in their actual work. But JP would collect the reference as a um, inspirational source. So in many ways, he was kind of like the the um, Daniel Day Lewis, is that the right the, the method actor? Yep. Right? So, I mean, okay. Um, I get the connection. Yeah. Uh, at the New York Comic Con, I gave a, a tribute panel. And um, yeah. one of the pieces uh, was a commission piece that he had done um, uh, of Batman on a, a subway track. Um, and just for a commission piece, um, he had 117 
separate images of various rear, uh, subway stations, platforms, wow. um, different eras. Um, and then there was another six or eight images of a satchel, like a money satchel bag where um, he was catching this thief, Batman was catching this thief. Um, and so the amount of dedication that he had, and, and again, those are all images to get him into that world. Mm -hmm. And then he would recreate and redraw um, the same objects, but from different angles, from different uh, perspectives. Um, uh, but again, it's Incredible. the level of dedication that he put into the craft, uh, into sequential illustration. You know, he he was someone that was drawing since he was a little kid. And um, him and his brother Alex, uh, they would work on comic books um, when they were, you know, uh, in elementary school, junior high. And uh, it can, you know, it really showed that this was a man that when he passed away, the comic book industry really lost um, someone that might not come around ever again because irreplaceable. Um, yeah, irreplaceable in the sense that there was the. It's kind of difficult to explain, partly because we're also trying to just when we talk about JP, um, a flush of emotion. Yeah. Um, yeah, comes over. Um, but uh, I would ask you guys: have, have you guys ever met John Paul at a show? Or um, yeah, I I hadn't had the opportunity. I've been familiar with his uh, work. I, I think for for a lot of people, they might be familiar with him and not realize it because he had done so many, you know, either fill-ins or short arcs with just about any character you can name with the. Oh, for sure. Two and you know uh, so much of his stuff. You know, like you get stuff where it would just be out of print for a while, like Static. Um, they were fighting to get that back in print for so long, and it's finally going to be in print uh, next year in the compendium that they're doing for Milestone, because uh, that's all been out of print for a very long time. Uh, and you know, I, I would think people people maybe listening to this or something would probably maybe most be familiar with maybe Earth X um, <laughs> in, in terms of just like a, a right. long run he had on a, on a series that was pretty readily available. And more recently, um, you know, it's Batman Creatures of the Night with, uh, you know, Kirk Usiak is, is probably another thing that maybe people listening to this or, or some other people saw fairly recently and could, could put the two, two together. But, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, it's hard not to find, even like, you know, he'd even like touch on some of these like you know seminal runs like you know Grant's New X Men and things like that. There's so many things he he had a hand in um, that I don't yeah, know. that New X Men is true. There was a full page splash of uh, a horse and a policeman. I think mm -hmm. yeah. um, there are just so many images that um, you know. Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, when you no, said that please. and you you know again, it's like all these images and artwork and. Uh, drawings, um, you know, kind of come to come to mind. Um, you know, I, I've been lucky to meet him. I, I wouldn't say I had a personal relationship, though. Uh, it, you, know, you rarely do. I mean, certainly, when you, especially when you're at a con, it's it's uh, it's a, almost a conveyor belt type uh, environment for a lot of people right. coming up. But what was notable about him, and and this is an industry, and not to um, see, how do I say this most nice way possible? There's a lot of uh, there's always a lot of dirt on people. There's a lot of gossip. That's a better word for it. There's always a lot of gossip. There was never any with John. Um, that I, I think one of the most, or at least that that got its way out there. <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> he, he was always described as everything that you're saying right now. Um, incredible hard worker. Incredibly diligent. Doing. I mean, I think the the comments I, I've heard the story before of, of drawing and redrawing and redrawing pages over and over. Yeah. Um, that was always the reputation. This this person who was so dedicated to the craft, and just people were uh, blown away at the amount of skill and, and time he puts into a page. And and I mean, and in many cases, the fact that he wasn't more well known. I mean, he he like you say, he's been on all these comics. He's had these amazing runs. He's been on almost everything for the big two in one form or another, or a lot of comics, I guess. I'm not overselling it, yeah. but um, it's it. it 
he's he's at Earth X, I think. Um, some of these comics that got more marketed, more well known. Um, it's it's only I think unfortunately till now that we're hearing a lot more about him. We're seeing a lot, which I'm glad we're we're seeing more of his work and getting more promotion to him. But uh, he was never there's never a controversy around him, and and it did his you, you're right too. His illness, uh, he did keep to himself. It, it took people by surprise. And it was, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I feel bad that, that if he was, you know, suffering alone, but at the same time, he had his family there, of course. He had his friends. Um, and I, I appreciated that he, it was never, um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, t- I'm tongue tangled, <laughs> tongue tied here because it, it was a, this is somebody who I have a lot of respect for. And right. every, I think the choices he made were all very, uh, incredible both for himself and for the people who loved his work yeah i mean we started again he started static i at the same time i started a book called uh, dr mirage at valiant right um actually john paul and i were both up for drawing static uh that summer at san diego comic-con 1992 uh, we had both uh, gone there under the guidance of uh, michael davis and his bad boy studio Michael Davis at the time was starting, uh, was one of the founders of Milestone Comics. And so um, he, my, they, Michael had, you know, gotten it down to either John Paul or myself. Got back from the show, um, Michael called me and said, they're going to go with John Paul. And uh, I was upset, but <laughs> you know, we all wanted to work. Um, and uh, when I got back to New York, I, I called the Bob Layden at Valiant, who, who had also met at San Diego, and Bob offered me my first monthly book. Uh, long story short, once we started working, um, I was like, "JP, let's go, let's John, let's go do some store signings. Let's go promote. Um, let's let's hit the trail. Let's uh, mm-hmm. I got a list of retailers. Let's uh, let's go to some shows." And he was always, uh, "Nah, man, I'm gonna stay home and work." Um, <laughs> You know, it was not about, uh, to him, the work should stand on its own, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It wasn't about um, doing all this kind of self-promotion. He uh, was purely about let the work stand on its own. Um, yeah. And uh, his co- career, 30 years, how many artists do you know? Or how many well, comic book artists? 30 years, nonstop, only comic book work right uh, yeah a lot of us jump in and out a lot of us do a lot of other things mm-hmm. um, although i got him to do a l- other stuff yes <laughs> <laughs> kicking and screaming yeah but you know i well i have never met john i have met michael davis but um I feel like that's a whole other conversation. It's a yeah, that's a whole other. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much time you have, Perch. Um, <laughs> we'll go until we. But Mike, Michael's a great guy. I mean, no, he, he, is. he took yeah. us. We were 18, 19 years old. He took us under his wing. He really showed us the ropes in terms of the business of comics. Yeah. And um, you know, again, John and I, we already went to an art high school. So by the time we got to college, we were already, um, we had already. You know, working at a particular level, and we were just basically trying to get our portfolios up to uh, a level of quality to, for companies to hire us. John had actually gotten um, two gigs with Dark Horse Comics prior to the Milestone gig. Uh, he was drawing; he drew a RoboCop uh, miniseries for Dark Horse. And um, if anybody gets um, finds any of those copies, you know that work is actually very different than. You know the work that John Paul, uh, towards the latter part of his career, the first stuff that he when he broke into the industry, it's very cartoonish. It was very stylized, um, but you can begin to see the growth as he progressed um, from Static, uh, Shadow Cabinet, uh, mm-hmm. um, Shadow the X Men, Logan. You know he had that black and white Logan run. Um, I think it was uh, one or two issues, or it was a special. It was uh, you, a one shot like story. One shot. Yeah, and, and Alex helped break the story, uh JP's brother. And actually Alex and me and Julio and a, a few of us all show up as bad guys in the in the book. <laughs> <laughs> right. so wonderful. Yeah. That stuff I, I think another big part of that though was um 
the, one of the ways that he and I connected were because we both liked a lot of illustrators that were not comics illustrated. So that's how Howard Chaikin and I became friends. Right. Was was because um, you know we both liked you know Jack Potter who was a teacher of JPs and then um, you know Bernie Fuchs and and Austin Briggs and Bob Peake and all these like mostly 1960s illustrators. And I didn't know hardly any comic book artists who were into that stuff. And so I went to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. And I, so I was doing illustration stuff out there. And even though we were on different coasts, I think JP's, some of his education was very similar at School of Visual Arts. So, so we were able to, I think we both liked a lot of the same, you know, because I liked more, by, by the time, like, early 90s, like when I got out of high school, I stopped kind of, I wasn't really into comics that much. Mm -hmm. And then I only liked stuff by different certain creators. And a lot of, most of it wasn't superhero stuff. All my favorite stuff was, you know, like, uh, like Howard's speaking of Howard, like the shadow, a bunch of guys standing around, you know, and then that, that introduced me to like Robert Fawcett and all these kinds of artists that, that, um, uh, you know, now when I would go to conventions and stuff, I try and tell uh, younger guys to start looking at. Um, but yeah, that was that was a good common. You know, it was like, oh man, you know, like it's kind of like you know when Bernard and him, you know, met as kids and they had the Thor thing. You know, it was like, uh, you know, it was this was us though in our early twenties and you know, connecting with artists we liked and like I said, faxing each other stuff and constantly sending stuff to each other and you right. know and, and when you're comics. Like, I mean we're just age, looking at the you know? artwork, right? Yeah. yeah, when you're that age you're always like, you know, I mean you're trying to figure out you know, you're getting excited by stuff and trying to figure out what you want to do and you know, it's so fun, you know, and then introducing each other to new stuff and you know, it's that's like the best time, you know. Yeah. I think yeah, I mean perch you you on on your um, YouTube channel, you know, you really want to, you really talk a lot about love of comics yeah. and this uh, magical medium that we all um, kind of um, found or discovered at some point, uh, and and now as adults, we've kind of cultivated it over the years, um, and uh, you know, we all have our own stories about. Well, you know, our first comics and then also how we met friends through comics and mm -hmm. through our love of comics and through our love of art. Um, I mean, comics is, the, the art is, is the, well, you know, I don't want to get into an argument about art versus writing, but, but <laughs> and you need both um, for, for yeah, a project sure. to be successful. Um, I did that hot take a while back. Yeah, I, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, kind of build on that a little bit, though, because, like, um, for example, I'd love to go back and talk a little bit more about static because, it, you know, uh, I, I feel like for a long time, you know, I know there are multiple people involved in the creation of, of static, and uh, I, I know for a while, you know, it was really focused on, you know, Dwayne McDuffie and, you know, Dennis Cowan. It, yeah, you know, Dennis Cowan Michael and Davis, uh, yeah. Michael Davis is the whole, yeah. that's a, yeah. But, uh, but there's, a, there's a lot of people involved in that. But this is a visual medium, and Static became this incredibly successful character who went on to, you know, have his own cartoon, have multiple relaunches, uh, was always the focus when they would try to relaunch and, and re rebrand uh, yeah. milestone over the years. And came the part, for sure. Yeah. And I don't, I, you know, and, and as artists, I, I think you would agree to, to at least a certain extent, I'm not sure how much of that is possible without John's art and knocking out of the park, um, you know, in those early issues. So like, um, did, did you, you know, talk to him during that time? Did he, seemed to grasp that he was working on something that was going to, you know, likely outlast everyone that's going to have uh, touched that property. I think at the time we were, we were both 20 years old. <laughs> we just wanted to work. 
yeah, we yeah. just wanted to draw <laughs> professionally. You know, I mean, we've been drawing on our own for so long. We're in New York City, the mecca of comics, or the mecca of publishing. Yeah. And, um, you know, even back then, you got to remember, this was 1992, 1993, um, walking up and down New York City uh, on the sidewalks, there would be street vendors that sold comics. Right. Uh, not just comic book stores. And, and comics right. were still available at your local, you know, the corner bodega or drugstore. Um, but street vendors were selling comics. Yeah. And um, it was a different time and it was a different availability. <laughs> of time. It was an aura. Like we'd walk around New York City and people would kind of recognize or, or come up with it. That's awesome. Yeah. But drawing at that time, I think we don't really realize like uh, what we're, you know, that, that especially how strong static uh, is the only character out of the initial milestone line that, you know, has generated any kind of like, it's, it has its own animated show. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first animated uh, show to have an African-American lead character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's still, you know, right, he's still running around um, DC Universe today. His new book just came out. Um, Nicholas is doing a great job on it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, no, I, there wasn't really a focus on, wow, we're really, um, you know, creating something um, that's going to be around for forever yeah. or, or 30 years. Um, it was really just about, um, let, let's do the best job we can do. Let's draw, yeah. just just have fun drawing. And, you know, that was another thing is uh, going back to that New York uh, NYCC panel. Uh, I was able to show some of uh, John Paul's um, portfolio that he had when he was a, you know, a teenager trying to break in. And he had these pages that were um, known as the Superman pages. And, you know, even when we were putting together this book, this artist edition book for uh, with Scott Dumbier, that was the first thing Scott remembered John Paul's initial portfolio uh -huh. as an amateur trying to break in uh, those uh, Superman pa pencil pages. Yeah. You know, back then conventions were also very different. You would see a lot of artists or aspiring artists carry around these large uh, portfolios, these big black portfolios that they carry around. They'd wait in line at every booth at every publisher. There would be an editor stationed at a table and, you know, give you like a five, 10 minute critique. Uh, if you can wait an hour, you get an editor who will look at your work. Um, yeah, people got hired that way. I mean, that yeah. was a, that was a, that's that's something that's kind of sad to be gone. I mean, I, I logistically, I, I can imagine that'd be a nightmare, you know, with how things have evolved, especially with yes. becoming more right. pop culture. But um, I've mentioned this to somebody else earlier. That's that's one of those elements of the cons that I feel is lost to us and it's i don't enjoy the con as much i i miss seeing people walk around with a big strap over the shoulder portfolio yeah. walking around knowing it was a bunch of people out there trying to get their dreams going it was uh i don't know something cool about that 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 added to the experience i think i think we're we're cheaper having lost it right yeah. uh, I, used to, I used to not really enjoy going to conventions that much until we all decided to start going together you know, so that was another, mm -hmm. you know, another, yeah. another way that, that got, you, you know, so every, we would kind of plan out our year of how, how, you know, we could be together uh, and travel to different cities or, or different countries, you know, or like JP and I did some licensing stuff for the um, Batman Begins movie. And so he and I were in England for a while for that. And, you know, so a lot of it, you know, it was the first time I had traveled overseas. That was like 2004. So, um, you know, so there's a lot of like big moments in my life that were with him, you know, so it was pretty, pretty cool. I wanted to just very quickly. And I, 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 I mean, this is where I'd spend four hours with you just talking old stories like this. It's, it's incredible. Um, yeah. but I want to talk about the book really quickly, just so people who are listening to this, you know, to, to put in their minds and, and on the screen, hopefully people are seeing a lot of, uh, information about the book, where to go get it and everything else. You mentioned crowdfunding. This is going out on Zoop, which is a relatively new platform. Not a lot of people yes. are, are familiar with Zoop. 
how did how did Zoop get into the picture? You, you had Kickstarter, I guess you had Indiegogo as options. Zoop became the platform. How did that become a platform? Well, For- Zoop, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Scott Dumbier helped us uh, yeah, tremendously. I mean, without him, I don't I don't think there would be this project. Um, and um, you know, he knew some people that were working at Zoop, and um, it's actually Zoop is is great because they're they're um, really putting their best foot forward. Um, and and a crowdsource funding, like you know, I have some other friends. My friend Jerry, he just had a, a Kickstarter uh, mm-hmm. called the Monkey King, and mm-hmm. you know, he, he, you have to go through the, all this promotion. You have to make all these videos. Um, and then you have to draw the book, <laughs> write and draw the book. And then mm-hmm. when you get it printed, you once you, it comes in, you have to box and ship everything. And uh, Zoop, um, I think their main appeal also as well is that um, they handle all of that. They handle all the fulfillment, um, all the printing aspect. And um, so it really made sense. Um, that uh, we we went with them for this project. Um, so the book is again, it's it's twelve by eighteen, uh, twelve by seventeen. It's a hundred and eighty some odd pages, almost two hundred pages. Yeah, um, it's a thick book. It's a heavy book. It's an expensive book. It's a premium book. Um, you know, we also have to talk about packaging and how it's going to be double boxed. So Zoop provides. Uh, well, they're going to be able to provide all the shipping. They're going to handle everything for us. And, and that really helps um, uh, for a lot of people out there that are considering uh, crowdsource funding projects. Fulfillment is um, oh, yeah. a huge pain in the ass. You don't really realize unless if you live in an apartment and you don't have a garage to store some of these books and boxes, just the sp- supplies to ship the actual books, sure. um, it can really get in the way. Um, and you can find yourself consumed with um, getting the right label, packaging everything correctly, and of course, everyone, the customers, they want to receive the books in a in a decent, you know, mint condition. Um, so mm. Zoop handles all of that. They handle the printing. Um, they're handling all the marketing uh, for yeah. this, and and so it really is helpful. I mean, Tommy is extremely busy on uh, Jupiter's Legacy. Um, you know. I got a lot of other things going on as well, and and so um, well, it keeps a focus on on your craft, and and right. you do not have to be worrying about uh, going to argue with the post office about different shipping rates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't like going to the post office myself. No, <laughs> who does? Um, and, and, and I already have uh, too much stuff in my place. Uh, I'm trying <laughs> to throw out stuff. So, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and the book is is like basically more or less ready to go to print like around the campaign like people are gonna you know because the thing people worry about sometimes with campaigns is like oh they say they're gonna ship it like this year but it's like three Mm. years later and where's my book kind of thing well i mean yeah this this that's the thing is this book's all done so Mm -hmm. so um there are some new aspects though um there are well one part of it is is while we were going through the artwork in jp studio we've we came across a bunch of his initial designs, you know, concept art uh, designs for the, um, you know, the rocket men, you know, these guys with these jet packs and all these different kind of character designs. Uh, there's just, there's so much you could do a whole mm-hmm. other books. You know, there's the pencils, there's the, you know, he d- did a good job of documenting everything. So there's a lot of extra stuff. And then as an incentive to get people interested in also some new things is a handful of us are doing prints. So we've got, um, we're going to have new, uh, like 11 by 17 art prints done by, uh, it was kind of important to do people that, that, that have people do it, that, that new JP and the JP was, was a fan of. What were you going to say, Perch? Sorry. No, just an incredible roster. I mean, in addition to two of you, two of you who are, I mean, obviously producing you know, incredible work now, uh, well known. You got Bill Kinsinkevich, you've got Lee Weeks, uh, Sean mm-hmm. Phillips, Walter Simonson, Dennis Cohen, Kim Young Ji, um, Joe Casada, um, and Douglas uh, Figueroa. 
Oh my, yeah. I, I mean, that's a that's an incredible roster of people. And what are the kind of prints? Are the prints that are being produced uh, in the world of the Wintermen, or is it uh, how 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 are those coming about? Yeah, they're they're in they're all Wintermen art. So Wintermen either um, uh, they're either of the characters or in the world of the characters. Um, you know, so like. Uh, Duncan did one that was very much an homage to the whole entire series, so you get to see a little bit of everything. Uh, Sean's is the main character. Um, I'm doing one um, that's one of the secondary characters and more of a landscape. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, you're going to get a bunch of us. Uh, Walter did one of all the, the Rocket Men suits, you know, with all the tech and weapons and everything. Yeah. I think we've seen some previews of that on uh, Twitter. I think he's been posting some. Oh, some yeah. Things. Um, but I mean, that's, that's, I mean, this is the, sounds like I'm in pitch mode, but this is like the ultimate director's cut here. You, you're getting the art full sized, unfiltered in its, in, in an incredible quality. You're getting, uh, his sketches, you're getting his concepts, you're getting from his close friends, uh, a number of kind of tribute pieces. I mean, it, if, uh, there's, there's not a, this is a complete package of, of everything for this series and, in, in probably you know, a format you won't see very often. Right. And and all the proceeds, again, go to JP's family, his wife yeah. and daughter. Um, none That's of us incredible. are collecting any a single penny. And um, everything that goes. Was, that was another family. cool thing why we liked um, working with Scott and Zoop on this was because they were willing to also, you know, do this as 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 something to kind of, yeah. You know, Jordan, Scott, we, we have an established relationship, but then, you know, the other guys, like, let's, let's build some more relationships, you know, and what better way to do that than to come together about something we, we care about, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Zoop guys have waived all of their standard fees uh, in production for this. And, and uh, again, all the proceeds going to the family. Um, That's incredible. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 well, I love the purity. I mean, there's there's fundraising that needs to happen and has happened, of course, many times uh, for people. And, and that's one of the uh, things we talk about in comics uh, all too often. Um, here, you're, you're raising funds for the family and you're getting kind of a pure insight into the artist. So in addition to helping out the family, you're getting this direct connection to the artist. And it's it to, to what you're saying, the, the love of the craft, the love of comics, being able to see something in its most pure possible form in this way. I mean, the only, the only more pure form is literally if, if you are selling the original pages themselves, because it's yeah. as, as close to that as you can possibly get. It's probably as close as, 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 as anyone will ever get, because yeah. I don't think that art will ever be sold. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, we're lucky enough to have art from JP just because you know, we would always give each other artwork, you know, um, there's so much of, of us in the work, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that's for us. And that's even like doing the prints. It's like, we're looking at Wintermen, but we're not really looking at Wintermen. We're looking at JP, uh, mm -hmm. and his work. And, and so our prints are kind of like us trying to get into his brain a little bit and to draw or paint, you know, his, his world that he created. So, um, yeah, I know there's a there's um, you know there's a lot of people that, that would love to have some of his art and stuff, and I think at this point it's kind of like yeah. you know we just want to everybody just kind of keep what they got and you know and and um, and it's just nice to have it I'd like this like we were able to get it all it's all there in a studio you know so you know um, it's nice to have it all together and it's nice that that it's there with his family it's cool. Well, the rare part about this is, I mean, in, you know, people can buy art. I'm looking at a, a lot of art on the wall over here, kind of in my my studio. And, and I mean, those are nice single pages. It's great. Love every piece. This is the entire book in that format, which conceivably, I mean, you, you're not going to be able to, to pick up the art for an entire series. <laughs> Just, I mean, I mean, I don't even know what that would cost. It would be an insane mission to go out and get. But here you're getting it all in a big format with all these other uh, perks. When, when is, uh, I think when this, you know, people are watching this interview, I think the campaign will have just launched. I think that's the goal is to time it that way. Um, when is the plan to actually get this shipped out? I mean, it, obviously the campaign has to close, but what is the, 
the thinking there for timing? I know the timing was before the holidays because that was kind of a, a, a good way for us to, hmm. uh, you know, move as many as we could, especially when people start looking at getting gifts and stuff like that, you know. So I th there's so many, especially with getting the other artists involved and, and there's also like with crowdfunding and stuff like that, like ful fulfillment to people overseas. Mm, yeah. Um, how do how you know how how can they take part in things like Kickstarter and stuff from Europe and stuff? So there there's things that we're doing behind the scenes with trying to figure out can we do anything with with retailers? You know, partner up with some people. You know, to make it more available with with places. You know, so. So, you know, we were we were initially hoping to have the campaign launched by now, you know, because you were like, oh, we have the book, we have, it's all scanned, it's mm -hmm. all ready to go, you know, um, you know, so, but now it's just all those logistics, you know, so that's the stuff that we'll be working out. Yeah, I mean, all, all the pages are scanned. Uh, some of the pages don't have word balloons on them. The, some were lettered onto the boards. Uh, but some of them you won't. There's no word balloons. I mean, part of the um, the other unpredictable f issue right now is the um, shipment from overseas printing, right? So yes. you know, there's a yeah. lot of container ships that are stuck in uh, at the ports. Um, so that might be, uh, you know, technically like a like an issue or a factor. Um, but otherwise, the book itself is done. Um, there's uh, again also waiting on um, some of the artwork for um, the the prints um, that are, are coming in. Um, there's going to be packages where some of those are going to be signed and numbered, mm -hmm. uh, so that um, creates a little bit more incentive uh, for collectors. Um, but yeah, I, I can't wait to get it uh, in my hands. I mean, the Winter Men um, trade paperback itself is sold out. Uh, I've seen it on eBay for up to $100 for that um, one small trade paperback um, uh, comic book size. So, um, you know, it, this is a, a passion project, but this is also uh, something that um, is a premium product. Yeah. And, uh, well, I'm hoping yeah. that people look at this and say, all right, there's a couple different reasons why you might want to buy it. If you're if you love comics, so one yeah, certainly if you love John, and I, I'm sure a lot of people do, and and you want to immerse yourself in his artwork, this is a great product for that. If you love just comic art in general, and you've been looking for something that gives you that pure experience, being able to see this stuff in such a you know a full volume, I can't stress enough. It, you can buy individual pages. This is the whole book being produced and given to you that way. That's that's a. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of other times they've done this. There's, they've done artist editions like this. This is a very unique yeah. product. So if you love comics, if you love comic art, even if you're unfamiliar with John, this is what a better what better way to get acquainted with both art and discover an amazing artist and an amazing story kind of in one package. It's uh, it's 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 absolutely incredible. And, you, know, you, you know, when Bernard brought up the word balloon stuff and everything, it's like the lettering, um, JP, like a, worked with John Workman a lot, like I always do, like Walter Simonson always does. And that's another even cool thing about the art is that you can see the lettering on there with it, which isn't done so much anymore. Yeah. And um, and even there's places in the art where they um, they did old school, you know, paste up, you know, with the, with the lettering. Um, so, you know, and then there's stuff that yeah, it's not there, like Bernard said, because, you know, it was done later digitally. Um, yeah. But... Yes, uh, but I mean, put it together digitally. John still, even like even the what we're doing right now on Jupiter's Legacy is he letters it all by hand, and then we put it together in Photoshop. So that's so awesome. He's still doing it all old school, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. I love that part. Um, I mean, that's a whole other topic as well. Just <laughs> kind of what's different with digital and kind of how those changes have taken place. I, I love seeing oh, yeah. work in this fashion. No, oh, and uh, we're we're definitely going to have to have you both on again at some point because I love that we're talking about this project and you know Tommy's <laughs> over here like yeah I know I'm working on this next Jupiter's legacy yeah you know, no big deal <laughs> except um, that 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 product's incredible too I, I'm yeah. loving it <laughs> and and you're seeing seeing Tommy's uh, work I mean he's uh, work wise Tommy is 
the Jupyter legacy is pure digital. Everything's digital. Yeah. Uh, JP was everything's on paper. <laughs> yeah. um, but the amount of uh, detail and, and uh, focus and attention um, that Tommy's putting into his work is the same as John Paul. And, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah I, I, should, um, I should say, I, my, when I say digital, I in no way describe it. A lot of artists doing amazing things with digital. It's just there are, you know, I'd love to talk to you about the differences between yeah. and what, what's changed and how they go back. Yeah. Well, I also uh, would love to getting up there, Bernard, but. talk with you a bit about uh, Gemini blood at some point. Oh, geez. Too. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. When I was drawing that, JP was drawing, um, I think, Shadow Cabinet. Okay, nice. And, uh, and then he was doing um, um, Challengers of the, of the Unknown. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he would, and then, and then he would fly to my place in North Carolina, and we and we jam out a, and get an issue done in a couple of weeks, and just you know uh, bang it out. I just had to do that recently. with Bernard came in and helped me on some Jupiter's Legacy, so it is. we're always helping each other out. Um, I mean, there's there's I just came across some, some art in the studio that JP and I did together that was for advertising for like pharmaceutical companies. Um, you know, <laughs> just weird stuff that we did throughout throughout the years that I forgot about. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, it's weird. I, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm loving, uh, Jupiter's legacy. This is the, this is my favorite volume. Um, oh, this cool. one you're on. I, I've enjoyed the whole thing. And then somebody will misinterpret that as me throwing shade at Frank quietly, but that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Lord people. Uh, but it, it's, it's incredible. And Bernard, you came off, you, you were just worked on uh, children of the atom. I've seen some other things. What, what, what do you have going on right now? The, the most controversial book of 2021. <laughs> was it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. For delays. I mean, was that was a, a lot of, uh, <laughs> I would like to clear up. Uh, there was some controversy about the last pages or something like that. Uh, ah, draw, okay, that was oh, all me. Yeah, yeah. That was Excellent. not anything editorial. That was all me. That was me looking at the original book that was already turned in and completed the first issue. Yep. And knowing that we had a little bit of buffer time because the book had been reslotted in the publishing schedule, saying to myself. Uh, I think the storytelling can be better uh, from a different angle with the kids walking through the portal from one mm -hmm. direction to the other. Yep. And I went and I paid the colorist myself uh, and I did it for free. Um, so there was nothing about any kind of uh, uh, what uh, people might um, suspect as uh, whatever conspiracies. Um, that drives me crazy. I, I'm, I mean, okay. So. And, it, and it's look, you know, you, you give an artist enough time, they're going to go back and change stuff. I'm, you sure. Know, yes. You're looking at stuff that I, I look at stuff that I drew last week. I'm like, oh shit, I should read. I don't like this. So I got to, yeah. but mm -hmm. some of it is because of production. You don't have time. It has to be turned yeah, in. It has, right. to, it has right. to come out to the stores. Um, so, but if you give somebody enough time on this, um, you know, anybody will go back and look at their stuff and then say, I can make some revisions here, make the story better, make the reading experience more uh, enjoyable or what, how I wanted it as a storyteller. Um, and, uh, anyways, yeah. Well, not but a grand really conspiracy out. from editorial. Okay. Good. <laughs> are, and, we uh, saying, are we saying that the internet sometimes, uh, has uh, bad faith, uh, arguments and interpretations of things? There, there, yeah, and not, right now I'm working on the Monkey Prince, which is a new book for DC Comics that's going to come awesome. out next year. Yeah, yeah. Um, the preview and that, great. that's like a an, uh, like a childhood dream come true. Mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome. I I uh, I've got to imagine, and and not to pour salt in that wound, but it just it it would irritate me to no end if I'm looking at something going, you know, I could tell the story a little bit better. I, like you said, I'm going to redraw it on my own dime. I'm going to color this on my dime. And you get that out there, and then the uh, the internet wants to create some <laughs> giant stupid controversy over why you did that, other than just right. love the crap. That would drive me insane. I don't I yeah. don't know how you guys handle that kind of stuff. It would. And I, it's like you you know you're sitting there you're like, do you respond? Do you answer? Um, how, how do you go about? Um, do you create yeah. more fire by you know? There's sometimes you can't satisfy everyone. Um, the, the thing is, you have to satisfy the story. Yeah. Um, 
that that's the most important part is the story itself. Um, and as the storyteller, as the artist um, on a comic book, um, I get the final say, right? And mm -hmm. it's a reflection of how I want to tell the story. Yes. Um, it, it it's a lot of well, we can stay on positive topics, but I mean, it's, it seems like a lot of stirring up trouble. I, I'm I'm used to the environment where you're in a shop and the reader or the the readers, the customers are in there speculating about this kind of stuff. But it's a different tone. It's fun. It's why do you think they did this? Why do you think this change was made? And yeah. lots of theories coming up in the shop. Yeah. Those are healthier theories. When I see it broadcast as news, news yeah. with a Z on the internet, that's where it, it no longer feels like that fun conversation in the shop. And it just takes mm -hmm. our attention away from the positive things. Perch, when you go into a comic book store, I mean, for me, right, Joe, Tommy, I remember like, or even now, going to the comic book store is like going to a bar. And the yeah. comic shop, owner is like the bartender <laughs> and you go there and he goes from one customer to the other one down to the yes. aisle and say yes. hey what you think of this book oh I don't, know, I don't know about this and then oh i really like that and it's uh, a lot of it is kind of therapeutic right? yes yeah. so you're there you're sharing with someone um this passion that we have this love that we have um for this medium for these characters um for this format of mm -hmm. just uh, entertainment and the escapism, and um, it's just magical, you know, shops. Um, and well, it's very, I mean, that's, that's how we grew up on that stuff, though, Bernard. You know, I mean, there were, were uh, you know, uh, you know, 80s kids, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. went to, you know, we went and got our comics at the, the corner store and everything, and it wasn't until I could drive uh, that, you know, that I was like, oh, man, we can actually drive to a comp act proper comic shop and everything and go to, you know, all that, kind of, all that kind of stuff, man. It was like so cool. Oh yeah. I used to get comics in the, in the mail too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the Brown, the Marvel comics come in the Brown paper bag. Yeah. They would never come mint because they would always get bent. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I did anyway. anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all, the pre all the pre-internet uh, these, Oh, those are happy times. I, I agree. That yeah. And half the people, I mean, I get enough cracks about it already, but man, if you could take a bar and a comic shop and mix the two together, then I think you've got something. You get your, you get by yeah. your comics, you get a drink, and you sit there and you talk and you read. That'd be amazing. Like, I think everybody, we all love comics. We all love the format. You know, if we can all sit down and actually talk face to face, um, like we're doing now, even, yeah. Um, yeah. it really, you, you really feel warmth um, in, in sharing our love um yeah. and sometimes when it's uh, you know on a on a phone or on a computer or through just words and stuff and it's a little different um, for sure yeah. yeah well that's that's back to this project i mean this is a project of love like you said at the beginning it's a it's a passion project on every front it's it's love for the creator it's love for the fans who are reading this or getting to experience this in a, in a new way and uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm really glad you guys did this. I mean, you didn't have to do this. Uh, there's, you're both busy. You both, I mean, you're like, you're there going, well, I've got this, you know, Jupiter's legacy project right now, you know, just happening to, ha I mean, you, you guys both have a lot going on. I'm, I'm really respect that you both took the time to do this. But we did have to do this though. I mean, because we love John and, uh, you know, he was like a brother to us. Um, I don't have, I'm an only kid. <laughs> so I don't have any brothers or sisters. But, um, yeah, so when I have a friend, um, that's family that you choose. And that's, yeah. and, and family is, I'm, I'm not Vin Diesel, but family is everything. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. You know, and so this was something that we had to do. Um, we didn't want to do it uh, because I would rather choose the, alternative is to have John here with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, JD helped me on um, Jupiter's Legacy, the first issue. There yes. was a whole sequence that he and I did together, the, the way that we've done so many things together. Uh, and doing it, um, there have been lots of times in the past several years where we're, you know, back of your head, you're thinking, I hope we can keep doing this stuff because there were lots of times when you weren't sure how his health was going to pan out. Um, and this time I, I, you know, so every, every time we'd be doing something 
I would kind of like take extra, you know, just take it in a little extra and kind of think, okay, this is a special thing we're getting to do here, you know? So, yeah. so there's, so it's kind of like, and then seeing it in, in, uh, in print and stuff is kind of, you know, it's always like, there we are, you know, like together again. <laughs> so even like, you know, that's, and that's like, so, uh, so yeah, that's like, we've always done sketchbooks together and all these things. And I had a, I had a, a show I was writing and directing an animated series for Google and J I, and I had JP doing all the designs for it, you know, and cause it's like, you gotta work with, with who you love, you know? So, yeah. you know, it's, it's all that stuff. <clears throat> and we're always 14, to help 14 years, 14 years, John Paul battled cancer. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, um, that's a that's really heavy burden to carry. Almost half of his career and yeah. almost half of the books from Winterman on, he had drawn while battling cancer. Um, we were just thinking about that time that you and I were down there. We were at the oncologist's office um, years ago, and, and that book I did, the other book I did with Mark Miller called 1985 for Marvel mm -hmm. had come out that week. Mm -hmm. And we were in the office, and I was calling comic shops to see if it was, if it was out. And just to make JP laugh while we were at the – doctor and i kept asking in the shops it was it good because i'm not going to come pick it up if it's good is it a piece of shit you know all this stuff. Yeah. and yeah that was just all so we have good good you know good memories uh, mixed in there what is I, I want people to be listening to this and go and support this project because it's uh, on all fronts it's you know not only you're helping some people out but you're giving yourself something that i think is going to be powerful on your shelf but oh other, yeah, I mean, when I approached certain artists to do a print, they were like, I, you know, I'll, you know, and it's weird to ask somebody to do something as a favor, you know, as a gift, you know. So, sure. but you know, all of us are like, yeah, I do this just to have the book. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, we all want this book. Yeah, yeah I can't stress enough um, that piece of it for people listening to this, not as familiar with John. Where I mean. All is probably the answer, but what what other once you've paid for this book, you have this coming to you. What are other things people should go check out with from John? That you well, this creature of the night that came out this past year was was That's great, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but he's done so many little things, like a Nick Fury uh, one shot. You know, like mm -hmm. he did a Tom Strong story. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, he did a, a Ex Machina thing. He did yep. um, a couple issues of Detective Comics about a uh, an airport terminal and, a, and a, an airplane with like these uh, like a, a, a plague on an airplane. Um, mm -hmm. Captain America, uh, you know, and it's just like all this stuff. It's uh, um, you know, and then you know, and then you'll be like, oh yeah, I forgot he did that Midnighter thing or you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. there's so much and then you know and because every every editor with half a brain wanted to hire him yeah and you know but yeah it was like uh but like as bernard said he was he was such a private guy and lots of times people will come up to us at conventions and stuff and say you know oh where's jp or what's he working on how come this thing isn't out yet you know and 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 we would sit and not say anything, you know, because yeah. we wanted to keep stuff private. And sometimes it would boil my blood because, you know, people would complain like, you know, where's this comic that I'm owed? And, yeah. you know, there's, there's real life stuff that's going on, man. You know, yeah, there's, yeah. there's real life stuff that, that is uh, more important than you get in your book right now. Well, I, I wish people would just take a, take a pause for a moment and before you, before you choose to get angry about something, just consider okay. there may be some other routes into this thing yeah. that you've considered. I mean, before you, you immediately pick anger as your go-to. Um, yeah. We used to go to conventions. I mean, when we formed a studio called the Boulevard a few years ago, uh, Tommy, John Paul, uh, Sean Chen, Trevor Goring and myself, it was really a, a ploy to just an excuse to hang out. <laughs> so Sean can tell his wife he has to go, and you know, Tommy uh, yeah. tell his wife he has to go somewhere. JP gotta get um, to work, right? Yeah. And we would hang out. We we uh, shoot the shit. 
Um, we'd sit in the hotel room and draw each other. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, funny story is like John Paul, um, we call him Mr. Freeze because uh, <laughs> we'd stay in the same hotel room. He would turn it, the air conditioning as high as he could to get it down to like 60 something degrees, almost where you can see your breath. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, John, I mean, why don't we just, uh, why do we have to, you know, because you like to cuddle, on, I'm not cuddle, you like to like huddle underneath the, cuddle. <laughs> <laughs> huddle underneath the sheets, the the, the blanket, the comfort. Yeah. I'm like, well, John, why don't you just like turn the temperature just up a little bit higher, <laughs> then you don't have to use the blank, the comforter, right? Yeah. He's like, no, man, it's not the same, you know, <laughs> combination of cold and warmth. I and have after, to Nothing like being in San Diego at a con or someplace where it's incredibly hot and then walking yes. into the room and having a heart seizure from a <laughs> right. degree drop. But, you know, the thing is, like, there was truth to that. You know, yeah. So now when I go to a hotel, I don't do it at home because I'm cheap. Um, but <laughs> at a hotel, yeah, I'm, I'm turning that air conditioning down as cold as it can get. Yeah, you're the new Mr. Freeze now. Now when we go places, I'm like, oh, great, here we go. <laughs> and, uh, you underneath the comforter, and you you have this warmth. Yeah, um, yeah that's true. I sleep better in the winter for sure. Same reason. Yeah, yeah. I it, it's an incredible project. I do want to. Uh, I want to want to stress people should go check it out. I also uh, not to rush, but I, I would love it if we could talk to you guys again and, and talk more about your projects. Would you be willing to talk to us again in the future? Yeah, of course. Awesome. Yeah. I, I um, definitely, I think more people hearing these kinds of stories is, is helpful. And, and if, if nothing else, um, breaking up some of the the bait that gets thrown out on the internet that is uh, is there for ad clicks and not oh, <laughs> any yeah. real yeah. hobby. Well, it's, it's fun to see um, to, and to remember that these, these comics are, are made by people, you know? Yes. Yeah. Just, like, just like movies and cartoon shows and you know, everything else is behind it are, are some people that are living life and, and, uh, you know, have ups and downs and, you know, I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, even when I'm, you know, like lots of times I'll hate a movie so much that I'll bitch about it. And then I remember that, you know, man, there's some people that work so hard on this thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, yeah, you know, it's, but it's an art form. Yeah. You know, and it's all subjective. It, it's tricky to find that line between, you know, you want people to express themselves and blow off steam and be sarcastic in some cases. And, and where's that line between sarcasm and cruelty? And yeah, it's, well, it's, 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 it's a line people seem to struggle with these days. I mean, we're all very picky. I mean, that's, I mean, JP was a very private and um, polite person, um, more than 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 I could really be. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, when we're just together and it's just us, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, because you're you're picky about your own work and you're beating yourself up all the time. So you know, as, as you're doing that, of course, you're going to tear everything else apart too. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> so, so, I mean, that's what we do, you know, because you want to be, you want to, you want your work to be the best it can be, you know, and, and, and that's also, we can all critique each other's work and we know that we're being honest with each other. So, yeah. you know, if something's not working or, or, you know, I mean, that was another thing about JP. If he said, I, I like this, this is working. You knew it was genuine. You know, um, you know, yeah. so, yeah. you know, it always, he always had something to offer. And if he didn't, you're like, wow, okay, I guess, you know, um, you know, and he'd always send you something, you know, what do you think of this? Let's tear it apart. You know, let's make it better. You know, and we're always, there's an infamous um, critique that Alex Toth did of Steve Rude's uh, Johnny Quest story. You've probably heard of this, Perch. Yeah. Um, and uh, the big number one thing in there was fakery. He always talks about the Toad was always talking about the fakery. You know, look at and the, the word. I never heard that word until that critique, fakery. And that was always um, our biggest fear was that Toth would look at your story and you, <laughs> you'd find the fakery. And that goes back to what Bernard was talking about with the reference, you know, and the research. And if JP was going to draw a Soviet 
you know, gun or soldier in a certain time period with a certain vehicle or, you know, it was going to be nailed, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's just a, uh, uh, once in a generation kind of dedication there. And we talked to a lot of writers. I mean, we've done a lot of interviews with writers and editors in the past, not as much with artists. And, I, and um, I, I'd love to talk to more artists because I think that's a side of the story that people need to hear more of. But um, with the with the timelines and with the schedules and the and everything else, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, just it doesn't feel like the artists are always put in a position to be able to invest in the craft that way. If they're if they're having to pump out pages is kind of rapid fire. I mean, it, you know, you mentioned Bernard, you went back and redrew that page. But part of the reason you're able to do that is because of the delay of that book coming out, right? right. I mean, how, how, I mean, I, that's got to create a weird paradox for, for, for both of you of, of you know, you, you're wanting to make it as realistic as possible. You're also on this, I use the word conveyor belt a lot of just trying to hit deadlines. Like, how, how do you wrestle with that? I mean, you're, you're battling a lot of different things. You're battling inner demons. You're battling your own ability, your own skill set. Mm -hmm. How well you draw, how well you tell the story. Um, you're battling translation, translating the script or the plot from the writer into visual um, images. Um, and then how does it read from someone? Excuse my birds. <laughs> People avoid my chair. I like uh, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in my wife's office right now because my dogs are wrestling. So, yeah, we're always, we're always dealing with it. I love it. <laughs> but yeah, there's a, there's a constant struggle, right? So, yeah. um, and, and, and there's a reader, someone who has it. Because when you're drawing, you're, I'm, you know, you're locked in a room. Uh, sometimes I don't go get the mail for a week or so. Um, if you're on a tight deadline, you're, uh, you know, I've been up all night working. Uh, I haven't slept yet. Um, I'm gonna take a nap and then get back up and start working again. Uh, it's a very different kind of lifestyle, right? Um, working on a monthly book is also different than working on like a limited series or a graphic yeah. novel. A monthly book is, uh, you know, you constantly have to get work done. It that's why I've done. never done it. <laughs> There's other, you know, I have a colorist that's working uh, after me. I have, you know, letters, all these different people it has to, he, he has to get, the colorist has to get enough time uh, to work to do his best job, um, and so on. Um, and, you know, the companies have budgets. Uh, your sure. books need to be done at a certain time to hit a certain printer date. If it gets delayed, there's additional costs. Um, you know, all these different little nuances. Um, so, yeah, w when I was at Valiant when I first started, uh, Bob was my mentor, Bob Layden. Also, Barry Winter Smith was there. And one of the things that I learned um, from Barry and Sean Chen and another artist, he listens to your show a lot, Perch. Oh, really? Oh, that's um, nice. Sean. Um, Barry said to us young guys, he was like, look, get the work done. Turn it in. Recognize and analyze uh, your work. Know which mistakes you make. Uh, just don't make the same mistake again next time. And uh, I've kind of... Uh, part of me is, is gone with that in sense that, you know, you have to finish the work on time um, because there's a, it's a monthly book. It's a production aspect to it. Um, you want to do the best job you can do. You want to do the best work you can do because it's a reflection of who you are. We spend so much time by ourselves drawing. Um, the artwork is an extension of yourself. Uh, so when someone criticizes it, it's going to sting. When someone praises it, it's going to be uh, maybe a little um, uh, inflating. Uh, you don't want that to overinflate yourself. Some people tend to <laughs> get really big heads. Uh, sure, um, with everything. Yeah, but you know, you, there there is. You have to keep moving forward, uh, and you want to keep moving forward and recognize the mistakes that you might have made in this last issue. Um, and then not make the same mistake again uh, next time. Um, That's good advice. I, I like. I, and, and Tommy, I wanted to get your opinion on too. But I, now you've opened up another question for me, which is, you you both have benefited from having both this good partnership that you've talked about with John and and with kind of the circle of the group that you collect had. Um, but you also describe mentors, and I mean, I I, I think 
you know, having mentors in the form of uh, like Barry Windsor Smith and Bob Layton, I mean, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's two pretty powerful mentors to have. Um, is that something that we still get today? I, I, more and more when I talk to artists, particularly people who are up and coming, one of the common things I, I hear is that it's many people are not getting that kind of support. Is that true? Or, or do you, do you have a point of view on that? And, and it feels like that would be a pretty critical thing as you're coming into the industry to be able to have that kind of advice. I wonder if, uh, I would think it would almost be easier now. I mean, yeah. I don't know. With, with, I, I, gotta agree with Tommy. I think it's easier now as an individual artist, independent artist to reach out. Look, comics, this We're is the only them. entertainment industry that you can actually reach out and meet the professional. Yeah. Uh, and most people will probably reply back to you at some point if you go up to a show at a, at a convention. It's not like a professional athlete or an actor or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what, what I do think is missing is uh, back when we first started, John, Paul, and myself and Tommy, um, you know, I was at Valiant. Uh, Valiant had a bullpen. So mm -hmm. similar yeah. to the old Marvel bullpen. Bob would be sitting in the middle. You'd have the artists, the pencilers, the inkers, the colorists, the production company, uh, production department, the sales department, all under one roof. And so you couldn't help but absorb um, knowledge. And Bob would hold uh, lessons every every week or so, uh, you know, inking lessons or storytelling lessons. And I mean, he really, Bob really guided me um, in my first few years, along with um, other editors like Mark Moretti. Um, so from a company standpoint, that probably does not exist now, especially with the influx of uh, global talent. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's, uh, if you look at the uh, sales sheet uh, previews or whatever, uh, a good amount of the artists these days are international. Uh, yeah. Artists. Yeah, absolutely. And so they probably would not be able to have uh, this same experience of working in a bullpen under the same roof with a lot of people. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of them are on their own. However, I mean, with social media, uh, you know, people can watch your show. They can hear other artists. Well, I didn't know what uh, Walter Simonson looked like when I was drawing the Thor and I met John. Um, if Walter walked next to us, I <laughs> we wouldn't know uh, who <laughs> yeah. he was. Um, so I do think like nowadays it is easier, but you have as an artist, you know, there, a lot of artists are introverts. You don't want to reach out you're shy uh, but it's actually easier i think if if you but you have to take the initiative um that's interesting i i think um you're right though of course it is easier to connect with people but it's it's uh i imagine that the conversation is different the communication is different like you said the, in a bullpen or just being around people it's a different um relationship that you start to get with somebody else, maybe one that's a little bit more comfortable, a little bit less forced. I mean, I'm sure a lot of companies are grappling this now, given that everybody's working from home and, you know, with, with COVID, I'm sure a lot of people are experiencing this, but um, it's interesting. We, we have technology that now can connect us in theory better than ever before. Yeah. But maybe we're not connecting as well as before. Well, I see that with, well, with, especially with a, with younger folks, Yeah. Um, you know, that, that don't really, have as much interpersonal, you know, like in, in person contact stuff. And right. I mean, like, like, you know, um, for me, it was at college, you know, with Bern Hogarth and all these guys, my teachers there. And then, and then meeting Howard Shaken at a convention. And then eventually he and I shared a studio and, you know, then that's the kind of exactly what you're talking about with having that kind of, um, the environment. Like I, I never worked at a, at an office or had anything until later on when I'd be working on films or, or animation or something where I'd spend time on a set or something. And, and I actually really love it. And I, and actually I love that more now than when I, w when I was younger, I kind of wanted to be by myself and do my stuff. Now I'm kind of sick of it. Yeah. I just want to, now I want to be with other people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I suspect I mean, a lot would, of people are feeling that way now. But. Yeah. You know what, like YouTube, I, I have like a, a Twitch stream uh, every Tuesday. Tommy jumps on, Sean jumps on. Uh, last week we had a sketch battle with Koi Fam. Oh, cool. And then Jim Chung showed up at the last minute with an even better drawing than the two of us. <laughs> um, so if I was a young artist, I mean, 
Dave Finch has a YouTube channel. Yep. Jim Lee draws on Twitch, and you can watch rewatch that rewatch those episodes on YouTube. So you can actually see um, these professionals working and seeing them create something. Now there is the human component that Tommy mentioned that is missing. You know, you, you can't be next to someone and actually get instant um, uh, response or replies and um, and working in a studio. You know, if you get kind of bored, you can kind of walk over to the next table and, and look to see what they're doing and all. And it might inspire you. Um, but I have a hidden camera in Bernard's place. Shh, so shh, every once in a while, when I get bored, I can <laughs> check it out. <laughs> he hacked into my home security network. So that's a whole different relationship then. Now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been a very tame interview. Uh, yes. In time, yes. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a bleeding cool headline we just got know, right there. It's, uh, but um, I think this is a uh, this is probably one of the the greatest times, and in a sense that everything changes and we have to adapt. Uh, technology is definitely uh, connected people um, from very far away. Uh, but there's also something that's missing from the human factor. Even when we, we talked earlier about, you know, a comic book shop versus a, and a bar, right? And um, yeah. just stuff that's happening online. Um, if we meet in person, it's a much different. Um, uh, act you act person. different in really, person too. You, know? you do. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I, there's somebody that, you know, Children of the Atom, I saw mm -hmm. a video where someone completely bashed the book. And then I actually I bumped into the same. <laughs> I actually bumped to the same person at a shop. He was super nice to me. He wanted right. my autograph. They usually are. Yeah. It's yeah. look. It um, <laughs> there's something is just about being in person, uh, mm -hmm. meeting someone else, and talking. But also, about the technology really of of uh, not having to have the art leave the studio now. Mm -hmm. um, the you know going back to how all the art of Winterman was still at JP's place. Mm, um, awesome. You know, I mean, all these things that like technology has done to help us um, where I can, you know, be working on. I mean, well, Bernard was at my place a couple of months ago and he'd be sitting at the other desk and he'd airdrop this file to me. And then I'd work, you know, and it was just, you know, all that kind of stuff is great, you know. Um, the easiest. All right. Well, I love that. I love that we went in this direction then because I've been kind of miserable about the lack of mentorship. But you guys are, are pointing out a lot of great things here, which I'm feeling very good about. So, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm entering, um, well, yeah, you do have to reach out as an artist. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm mentoring a kid right now, uh, or actually a couple of different students, college students. Um, but I tell them, look, I can't, I'm not going to push you. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to give you assignments, but I'm not going to push you. You have to want to do this yourself. Yeah. This is a very painful career path. To be an artist, it's not pleasurable at all. Um, <laughs> a lot of suffering uh, because there's a lot of struggle. You know, you're drawing stuff. You you have to build up a skill set. Being a comic book artist is probably one of the most difficult careers because you have to know how to draw everything. Mm. Right? If you work in animation, if you work in some other form media, you know you're very. It's very segment segmented. But a, a American comic book artist, you have to draw everything. You have to draw yeah. people. You have to draw buildings, cars. You have to design stuff. If you're really into the craft, you have to be able to draw everything. Um, See, I think a lot of people have this impression that it's it's um, uh, you just get some paper, pencil, you just sketch a few things, you get a Levi's commercial, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Levi's, I, 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 I have, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also uh, um, uh, entertainment media. Yes, yes. Right. It's also something that um, there's a particular X factor, that a wow factor to someone's work, that mm -hmm. maybe technically it's not on the same level as another artist, but there's just something about it that when you look at it, it just excites you. Um, well, with the volume of comics coming out, too, I mean, there's a pressure to do something nobody's ever seen before. But that's that's going to get, I mean, that's, I, Joe and I go through it, I torture him with it uh, every yeah. week. Of like, hey, there's, you know, 150 new comics coming out this week. I mean, that's a huge yes. volume. 
<laughs> but if you if you think about that, 150 new uh, comics, right? Uh, 50 something for Mar- if we're just talking Marvel DC, yeah. Um, and then maybe like like double that uh, for other projects that haven't come out yet. So yeah. you're looking at around 300 to 350 working artists at one time for Marvel or DC. Yeah, uh, that's fewer. That's less than the number of NBA active NBA players. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> and if you think it's difficult to be an NBA bas- professional NBA basketball player, how much more difficult is it to become a Marvel or DC comic book artist? Yeah. Right. Um, because of the skill set that is required. I uh, love that analogy. To reach that particular yeah. level. And there needs to be a dedication. That's why I tell like the younger artists, you got to want to do this because yeah. it's a lot of work. Um, your lifestyle is very different. Um than, than well, other normal people. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the things that I think I, I do wish more people understood, especially with the, the critique that comes out. It's, it's very fashionable to go at uh, the comic industry in various ways. I, I, I try and be balanced, not over get, do too much, but it's, um, it is an industry where people, and including the writers, everybody else, I mean, you're not in it to be a billionaire. You're, you're, not, you're in it because there is passion. I mean, nobody would pick this to get rich quick, you you got to. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, <laughs> but it, it it's you you have if you don't in it, if you're not in it because you love it on some level, I mean you're not going to survive for any length of time. Right, right. There has to be a passion component. Now, look, I'm not saying that uh, I do think you can't make a comfortable living as a sure. comic book artist. I always think that I should be paid more um, than what I'm being paid now. Uh, and I think most artists think that way. I um, yeah. uh, I certainly should have been paid more when I was younger, uh, making all that money for Valiant. Um, but there has to be a passion. There has to yeah. be a love, right? And part of that comes down to the rooted love, the deep-rooted love of comics when we were reading them when we were younger. And, uh, you know, Tommy read comics when he was young, um, and that has transition to a career um, drawing comics and doing and just drawing and creating and designing. Um, and so very much we're living our childhood dreams. Um, you know, but it, no matter how much money you're being made or how much money you're making, even if it's a ton of money, if you're still staring down a, you've got to get a number of pages out in 20 days to meet a deadline, like you said, and be an expert in a sci-fi landscape and a metropolitan area and a car from the thirties and all these different people <laughs> all simultaneously. Right. The money's great and, and people should get paid more. I absolutely think people should be paid more. Uh, but if you don't love it, you're not going to survive that no matter how much money's on that table. Right. So, and then you have to balance that, you know, once shows open up, I mean, New York comic con was last week. Yeah. Um, next week I'm going to London. Um, there's, you know, shows all over the world. Uh, people, uh, this, how do you balance time? How, yeah. wh- where, you know, luckily now you can draw on the iPad, so you can draw on the plane. But, um, before when we first started, you had to make sure you, you were next to a FedEx so that you can mail the pages into the inker. Um, right. I'm curious to get your take on you or, you or, or Tommy, either. Um, Sean Murphy made this comment. I'm curious to see if you, you agree or disagree that at conventions, um, it's typically the writers who get into more trouble than the artists because the artists don't have the time to get into trouble. They're up in the hotel room drawing the commissions or meeting a deadline every night. <laughs> and they just, they don't have any, they don't have any time. Does that, does that ring true at all for you guys? What do you mean trouble? Well, like- I mean, the, the various things. Just the, there's no time, I guess, is my point. Like after because hours, like shenanigans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. any of that kind of stuff. Oh. Not to get into the details <laughs> of it. Just, just do you have think, time? Can you go get? Bernard and I are thinking of of um, <laughs> of our own stories. Okay, uh, <laughs> but, but we we don't get into trouble with with people we don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, look, look, it, artist is, is a very time consuming. I, I consider yeah. myself a fast artist. Mm-hmm. Um, I consider myself. I can draw. I think I can draw a little bit faster than average. Um, uh, with a at, at a particular level of quality, right? If you give me more time, of course, I can even draw even better. Um, but writers, you know, yeah. uh, 
prolific writer writes four to five books a month. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For one of the big twos. They're writing three, four, five books a month. Um, they have a lot of time on their hands, really, even at that. Um, yeah. so, but an artist can only draw one book, really. Right. Yeah. I, at one point, I, I tried to draw two books at one time, and I, I was dead. Um, uh, even but, speedy. So or both of you, if, you're on, if we're on a scale here from, like, Mark Bagley to Paul Pope, you, where are you <laughs> – on that in terms of getting in trouble at shows? No, no, no. Speed, <laughs> speed. Oh my God, no. <laughs> now I want to know what Bakley's up to. Um, sorry. No, it just in terms of speed, you're saying you're, you're faster than average. Uh, oh. Uh, Mark Bagley being the fastest? Well, I, I don't know if that's – that's the reputation. You just drawing like two books a month at one point, right? Yeah, he was drawing two books a month. He just crank yeah. stuff out like a man. Yeah. You know, how he does it, yeah. I mean, I'm way I, too slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Tommy's work is so intense yeah. in the layering and the complexity in his work. Uh, and he's also doing, you know, the line art and the colors, the finishes, the renders. Um, you know, that there's so much more intricacies in what Tommy does compared to what I do. Um, I just pencil and ink. Um, you know, I've been working oh, just, with just uh, pencil Marcello, Marcello Maiolo. The color some last few books. Um, and, and you know, again, if we had more time, uh, I think the work would look even better. It, it's really also like uh, some projects I, I have to th consider. Oh, should I draw this digitally because that'll I could probably save a little bit of time. Yeah. Even the original pages now, I'm working on 11 by 14 as opposed to 11 by 17 in a smaller format, but I'm using a 005 micron pen to ink. Um, so the line art, you can't tell any difference when it's printed. It still looks as if I'm drawing uh, wow. in traditional size. Yeah. And just the ink, the decrease in paper size saves me maybe like a 10% um, time frame, which is you know half an hour, 45 minutes to an hour per page. Over the course of a month uh, of a twenty-page issue, that's maybe a day, um, yeah. yeah. Which is like a day that I can actually sleep or uh, go run errands. This is a business of passion, folks. I mean, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to go to the post office to ship stuff. Yeah, oh, that's why Zoop is so fulfillment. Another plug for Zoop, but. Um, no, I, I, mean, I'm, I think this is a good project for Zoop. I mean, Zoop's trying to, to kind of put themselves on the map, obviously. This seems like a great project to do it in, not only, you know, because of the importance, the love for this project, but also it is a very unique project. I think it's one that can help get them on the map. And yeah. I'm excited to see it. I uh, Listen, both of you, you, you've gone way longer than I, I try to. I'm always sensitive people's times, but uh, well, when we talk about comics, I mean, we can talk about it all night. And uh, yeah. I mean, we got all these other stories that we haven't even told you about getting into trouble at shows. True, um, yeah, and that's just the shows. So uh, <laughs> we should. Have, we got to have this this bar comic shop. That is the that is the the money idea. I'm all behind. Yeah, it. Here we go. I mean. The, Look, we, we all love comics. We, we all read it when we were younger. We're still reading it now. Things change. Stories progress. Um, but the medium itself, um, you, can, you can feel it. And I, can, I think you can feel the love. Um, because you do have to love comics. Um, yeah. It's such a personal thing. You know, Tommy mentioned this earlier. Who you work with is so much more important these days yeah, yeah. Um, when you take on this project when you take on projects and, uh, yeah i mean there are projects that i don't i won't do because of those things you know so mm -hmm. it's, i mean but luck, luckily i'll have that luxury you know of, you know not all the time but you know you often you know you can kind of choose who you want to uh spend <laughs> huge chunks of your life with well, so, uh, that's normal right i mean i there, there's been some people who picked at that kind of this idea of of well you know they're picking their team but it's a team i mean if you think about kind of the relationship that you know a football team would have or a soccer team would have you know you 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 need to build up that trust in the team because you, you execute like a team so 
this idea that people, whether they're in a studio or on a book, yeah, you, you should be working with people that you trust, people that you have that kind of synergy with that leads to a, a better project. I mean, that's that's just, I, I think that's inherent in art. You, how, how are you supposed to make great art if it's just this random slot in, slot out people kind of, it's not a knock on Dan slot. Just, it just, it, it's, it's, you got to have a, a group of people that trust and have each other's back or you're not going to have a compelling project. Yeah. yeah. Well, at, at the end of the, oh, well, I, say, I don't want to say at the end of it. I mean, the, the other thing too is when you look back at the projects, uh, you know, when we go to shows and people bring up books to get signed. And sometimes the books are from years and years ago. Um, Gemini Blood. They're like, yeah. They're like Gemini secret secret weapons. Oh, um, God. <laughs> <laughs> These are good uh, books. That was Tommy's Tommy's first work with secret weapons, right? Uh, um, right? Well, I was doing drawing that at the same time I was drawing My Name Is Holocaust for Milestone. Oh, oh, okay. No, oh, man. But but when when people bring up books and you know you're signing them, they're like time capsules. Right. I remember moments in my life. Um, that, uh, you know, how I was feeling, what was going on, how old I was when I was drawing this issue. Um, or in the, And so sometimes I'll flip through the books and, you know, get a kind of nice little recap. Um, but again, as, a, as an artist, so much of, at, at least from my perspective, um, so much of yourself goes into the work that uh, it, there's memory that implants uh, on every single drawing. And um, it's very weird. I don't know if a writer has that um, same, you know, because again, the, the writing, you know, a lot of readers, they, they don't read the actual script that we get. Yeah. They've never read, or they've never even read a script before. Right. And so they don't know what the writer initially wrote in the plot or script. I prefer to work in a plot format. We'll yeah. talk about that later, Perch. But um, yeah. you know, it's uh, you don't know what the changes are and how things you know, might um, change and, and and evolve just from what the writer has to what I have, um, and then what the colorist does. And then you look at Tommy; like every writer is also different. So Tommy's work with Mark right now in Jupiter's Legacy, and you know his writing style is very different. Um, than uh, writing style, uh, Gene Yang's writing style on The Monkey Prince. And yeah. um, there's a lot of different wheels and uh, yeah. parts moving. Uh, yeah. But it, it is uh, a, like a time. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, Tommy, they, uh, they rebooted Secret Weapons of Valiant a few years ago. Mm, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, is there going to be an omnibus? That's gonna come out. Oh my god! <laughs> Probably did like three issues or something. I mean, <laughs> oh, but but issues. it was written by 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 my friend Jesse the Hurricane Brudinka, and um, oh yeah, I just and, I was testing with him this morning. Yeah, see, I mean, we and then we did lifelong friendships. Yeah. So you know, especially when you're starting out, you know. So speaking of, of uh, you know, people you're working with now, I've asked this question and I feel he's always, uh, he's been too polite to answer. It's always, he's never given a definitive answer. So this is one of the things that a lot of people in the chat always ask us is uh, Mark Miller or Mark Millar? What's Miller. the right answer? Miller? Yeah. There you go. You heard it from, you heard it from his art collaborator right now. It's, well, I mean, it depends what country you're in too, though. There, and, and oh. Funny Scottish accent. Now you've made it complicated there. <laughs> no, I, people go to and war with and Another thing that people don't know is that it's Walter Samonson. Samonson. Okay, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Try that with uh, Walt next time. You're, uh, see what he does. Or, or it's Mr. Movie. Miller to me, though, when I was working on Jupiter. Uh, it was Mr. Miller to me. Mr. So. Oh. Excellent. I, I've watched people go up and interview him, and uh, he just rolls with whatever they say. And <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah, I've seen other people go nuts about it, but uh, but he's always very classy with that kind and of And it's Bill Sinkowitz. Sinkovich, okay. Sinkowitz. Sinkowitz. 
Yeah. There you go. Tom, Tommy Lee Edwards. Not yeah, Tommy. Tommy. It's Tommy. There you That's go. It's really only one of We'll save for Perch uh, and Joe another day. Uh, we'll t t talk about Tommy. Perfect. Tommy's my alter ego. <laughs> yeah, I would like that. <laughs> this go. was a bit that I started doing and then it went too far where I, I read this ridiculous article that said if you if you want engagement, mispronounce things in videos and then people will correct you and it, mm. it leads to engagement. I'm like, that. this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And absolutely numbers backed up. It was true. But I've now <laughs> I've now screwed it all up that I just say stupid stuff all the time, which explains my entire model. So anyway. There you go. Um, gentlemen, I, I want to. Uh, I, I would love to have you back to talk to you both more. Uh, I mean, yeah, let's, let's do that more often. More often. Yeah, that'd yes. be great. Also, please, um, <laughs> please, everybody. You know, the, you see the links in the in the description below. Obviously, you can you can search on this. Um, the Winterman, John Pollyon. Uh, the the book is out uh, by Zoop. Uh, you should head over there right now it's incredible you'll see all the details you've been seeing images of john's work obviously I, I have nothing but immense respect for both of you to for doing this i mean it, it's from the bottom of my heart thank you for what you're doing for his family and for putting this together i really that you know it, it's very special that you're doing this and I, I give you guys all the credit in the world well thanks for having us and yeah giving us the platform to, to talk about this so you do have a, a very large reach, Perch, and um, uh, terrifying. <laughs> but anytime anyone's talking about comics, they're talking about comics, and that's great. So, um, really appreciate um, you know giving us the opportunity to share our love uh, for John Paul uh, on this, and I hope uh, a lot of the people out there watching um, uh, will go over to the site and, and take a look as well uh, and, and support the project. Absolutely. Tommy Bernard, thank you very much. And we will talk to you again soon. Yes. Thank Sounds you. Great. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank yeah. you.